Uh, thank you guys for joining us. My name is Tara Coleman and I am an assistant publicist here at Brown Books Publishing. And on behalf of Brown, I am so excited to be introducing you to Tracy Richardson and Tracy Harding, discussing all things sci-fi and a free-flowing conversation. Before diving into the discussion, I do want to remind you that their books can be bought through the bookstore where you had originally heard of the event and on their websites. And we will be posting those websites in the comments as well as Amazon and Barnes and Noble. So a little introduction, Tracy Richardson is the author of the Catalyst series, a young adult series, which has won the Eric Hoffer Award and has an American Fiction Awards finalist. Tracy has a degree in biology and her science background plays a significant role in her writing. Her books are set in real time with themes that include quantum physics, the collective consciousness, the universal energy field, and the protecting of the environment. There is no second planet. Tracy lives in Indianapolis and enjoys crafting, cooking, and being outdoors. Our second author is Tracy Harding. She's a bestseller of the Ancient Future series and has published 21 books. Her work blends fantasy, fact, historic theory, time travel, and quantum physics as well, into an adventurous romps through history, alternative dimensions, universes, and states of consciousness. Her books have been published in several languages throughout the world. Tracy's latest release, This Present Past, a prequel to the Ancient Future series, is currently under option and being developed as a TV series. So before handing it off to Tracy, and Tracy. I would like to remind you all that there is a chat feature on the side of your screen. And if you have any questions that you would like us to ask, please enter them into the chat and we will get to as many as we can during the Q&A portion of, of the event. All right, guys, I'm handing it off to you. Okay, then. Well, I'll take over because I'm the one doing the interviewing. And what I thought I'd start with is um, why, why Tracy and me, besides we share a name <laughs> in common, um, why Tracy and I got together to do this interview. And um, I'll let Tracy give you her version of it because it was actually Tracy that um, contacted me. So I'll hand it over to you to why us. Thank you so much. So it's, it's kind of a cool story. Uh, one of my reviewers um, who reviewed Catalyst compared my books to yours. And I had been looking for another author who had similar themes in fiction, and it was kind of hard to find. So I reached out to you and um, ordered some of your books, started reading. And then um, when it came time to do this kind of an event, we needed an author of note. And I thought, well, you would be perfect. And so we connected and became friends right off the bat, like really gelled. And so. Um, yeah, that was easy, that conversation. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was great. Um, so we do have similar themes in our books. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, for years and years, I mean, I've been able to recommend people to, to maybe like Jane Roberts. I think she was about the, the only one. She used to channel Seth Speaks. Yes, she was about that, the only one that yep. could, really refer people to to go yeah that's kind of like my books but then that was before quantum so that was really more when we were dealing we had all the metaphysical terms to explain what was going on but we didn't have like all the quantum terms at that time that didn't really come in until I'd got to about book 14 or something and so up until that point all we had to 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 talk about metaphysics or uh, creating your own reality, which is something, a theme that's been in my book since the get-go, since the ancient right. future back in right. 1996. So to like trying to find somebody to actually go, oh, here's somebody who writes like me. I mean, Kim Falconer, she's another Australian author. She's another one that's kind of uh, gone into quantum um, and you can definitely feel the soul of her characters. And that's the thing that you get, I think, is a real kind of soul with the characters. Right. So what in, how did you, because we have similar, like you wrote a book called The Field. I wrote a book called Being of the Field at about yeah. the same time because we were both influenced by. By The Field book. In fact, I have it here. It's. It's Lynn, and you can see on my little tabs. Yep, it's Lynn McTaggart's book called *The Field*, 
the quest for the secret force of the universe. And the really cool thing about it is it's based on science and it's based on quantum, yep, quantum physics. And, uh, and that's where, it, so my, they, in the bio, it said, I have a science background. So I'm a complete science geek. So reading this, where all these things, like what you said, we used to look at as an esoteric metaphysical kind of thing. It's explained by science. And so exactly. I try in my stories, and I think you do too, with fiction, fiction isn't real, but it's true. So when you're writing about fiction, it's a great teacher and you can put these ideas into a format that someone who's not a scientist can maybe digest a little more easily and, and see, oh, that might be true. And even someone who's not even really very spiritual at all, because a lot of people, um, they like religion doesn't really do it for them, um, and they're looking for something else. Uh, quantum physics sounds all really, oh, and, you know, you look at metaphysics, that also sounds pretty out there. And you say something like, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, people think it's a cult quite often, which is completely different kettle of fish. Kind of stuff. Yeah. Exactly, no. And and that's the thing. I, even way back with like Blavatsky with the metaphysical society, like the um, Theosophical Society, um, she was talking in terms of quantum physics but using a different language. They would talk about this quicksilver and rather than like ORM, say, orderly rearranged monatomic elements, which is also a whole part of the zero-point field theory, like um, how they discovered the zero-point field right. and all that sort of thing, which you'll find out if you go read Lynn <laughs> um, or read either one of us too. We'll take you there eventually, you know. And that's what I noticed reading the field was that I love the way that you took something like soccer, <laughs> okay, um, probably jocks are not the first guys you that would do a lot of reading, but to oh, no. be able to <laughs> relate to something like quantum physics through sport, you know, all right. of a sudden you understand. Like, yes, you go run the race the night before you do the race in your head and you will run the race so much better. I used to be a dancer, same thing, when you're doing a performance or even something like this. You yes. know, you just see it going well and the next day it makes it so much easier, doesn't it? Exactly. So exactly. what attracted you to Lynn? Well, I had been reading a lot of different, you know, I've been reading physicists. I've been reading things like Wayne Dyer and Marianne Williamson, yeah. Chopra, um, yeah. a lot of those people. And then um, she was kind of connected to that, that group of people. And, and if you look in the back of her book, the bibliography is pages and pages long. So it just kept kind of yeah. pointing to her. And um, I read another book called The Holographic Universe by Michael Talbot, which is... Yeah, I've got that up here too. <laughs> yeah, which also talks about that. I mean, it, it's so much about how the power of our minds and this universal collective consciousness and this universal energy field or zero point field you know, there's a, a, a physicist from the 1800s, a Scottish, and we were talking about Scotland earlier. He's a Scottish physicist, Sir yes. Maxwell. He yes. talked about it. Yeah, he talked about it. Um, so now we have the terms to use to to talk about what exactly it is and to measure it. Um, so, it, and and you you held up the intention experiment, another one of Lynn's books. You know, they talk about like the power of prayer. So you don't have to, and you said, you know, you don't have to be religious. It could be, um, it could be a nun. It could be an Indian, American Indian shaman. It could be. Yeah, they use Buddhists, I think, in, in a yeah. few experiments, yeah. like uh, Buddhist monks. Yeah, but what they show is that this thought intention can affect outcomes for health is what they often do. Um, and that's in the book too. Just fascinating stuff. Well, we, I think it was What the Bleep that Do We Know when I saw that film. I, I actually literally cried that, that people could stop telling me that I was insane and I actually had science to back up what I was trying to tell people, which is everything is relative to the observer. They've proved that with the double slit experiment. Right. I've never seen the double slit experiment. Go look it up because it's very, very interesting how our thought affects what's going on around us. And that scares a lot of people because they yeah. don't want to be responsible. <laughs> Right. You know, it's like, oh, that's all too much but when you do you stop 
kind of getting battered around by fate and you do have things start to roll the way you want them to. And that's what the intention experiment was all about, is actually learning how to control that mindset But with your books and with my books, you're actually leading the reader through not only the science but kind of just readjusting their brain while they're uh, reading without them even being aware of it. And all of a sudden they're coming out of it going, wow, I feel so good. I don't know why. I don't know why I've got to read your books to sort of get that. Uh, And it's because you're having all that positive reinforcement kind of put into your head. Well, and it's also kind of like, Oh, I knew that. I knew that was true, but I couldn't trust myself. Marianne Williamson has a quote that goes something like, our biggest fear is not that we're going to fail or something like that. Our biggest fear is that we are more powerful than we could ever have imagined. And I'm I'm saying it. That was Nelson Mandela, I think. Oh, was it? Well, she said it too. So yeah, but it's basically, you know, we have this ability, but it's kind of terrifying when you take it into your own hands. Well, it is until you actually learn how to use it. Then it's really fun. That that's that's magic. That's what magic is. You know, when they talk about people being able to perform magic, do magical things, it's just that mind over matter, and realizing that what is out here is an illusion. And everybody will go, "Oh no, it isn't." It's like, well, look at the science. Actually, it is. That's just a whole lot of molecules you're sitting on right now. <laughs> they could just disappear like that. You know, zero yeah. point field theory. Well, in you fact, know. I saw an article, and I, I'm not going to remember the term, but they've discovered a particle that that doesn't act according to the known laws of physics. And it's oh, still, is that a neutrino? Neutrino? No, it's like a muon or something like that. It's a new <laughs> one. Right. Yeah, yeah. But it, they're saying, they, which is that that's what science is. You have these rules, and then you find something that breaks the rules. So they're thinking that that might be the particle that's the field. That's kind of yet yeah, blending everything together because you know from watching, like in um, in being in the field, which is the one of mine that you got, I actually bring up that experiment about you know the people that get prayed for um, heal quicker and the people that were in the other group don't so much. But the real clincher for that experiment was is that the healing took place four years in the future of the people that were being healed. So not only did it have an effect on the people that got prayed for, but it can actually be directional forward or backwards through time. Like they prove time is not linear. And the best conversation I ever had was on a bus where I bumped into the two scientists that actually did that experiment. And I'm going, I've just been reading your research. And that was, we were off. We had the whole bus just going, oh, my God. (laughs) You know, (laughs) there's no coincidences. That was not a coincidence. That's right. And you can actually heal the past yourself too. That's why people do things like rebirthing where you're actually going back, reliving the experience and doing it differently, you know. So all these kind of new eight therapies that people think probably are a bit woo-woo, actually, no, they're really, they're not. Like if you look at the science of it and it's just what we don't know. As you said, it's like everything is a cult until it's proven and then it becomes science. Right. (laughs) so um for the people that um aren't familiar with your work just give us a little bit of a um, kind of synopsis about the field okay so the field is about a high school soccer goalkeeper who has the supernatural ability to know where the ball is going to go before it gets there so he's accessing the field the collective consciousness and he's also a high school student. He's trying to get the girl. He's trying to make the soccer team. And he has a friend who's acting like a jerk. So he's got <laughs> other things going on. Yeah. And then Catalyst is um, a companion book. It's not a sequel, but it's the same family. So it's Marcy, Eric's younger sister. And they are on an archaeological dig in southern Indiana. And things start going strange pretty quickly when they meet two of the graduate assistants on the dig who are way more than they show themselves to be initially. Um, I also have an environmental theme in all of my books. So the field is talking about clean energy sources such as wind, solar, and uh, hydro. 
and then compares that to so-called clean coal, which is not clean. So that's kind yeah. of the environmental theme, yeah. And then, uh, Pat, yep. go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say, I've been watching, I don't know if anybody knows the earthquake guy who's on uh, YouTube, but I've been watching him and, and he, he tracks all the, the, the earthquakes that are going on all over the planet every day. And every time he zooms into one in the U.S., there's a fracking like Well, that's Catalyst. Right? Yeah, that's Catalyst. So Catalyst has a much stronger theme of, of environmental and it's fracking. So I made up. Yep story about fracking happening in southern Indiana, which it's not really a big fracking area, but um, so that yeah. theme, yeah. But, you know, give them a bit of gas and they'll, they'll frack, you know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Let them exactly. It. I was actually watching a guy in Australia, and this is so typical of an Australian guy, I tell you. Um, he's, he was trying to explain that the river had all these chemicals in it. So he's in a boat, a dinghy, and he lights it. The, the yeah. water. The water catches fire. Was, yeah, is he in the boat and the fire's all around him? Yeah. It's like you didn't think that one through completely. <laughs> totally proved your point. Make a great YouTube video, but um, didn't quite think that one through. Yeah. Um, so for people that are here for kind of, because um, I know when I do a lot of my interviews with writers, I like to ask about the writing process because a lot of people who are writers are interested in that kind of thing. And so I kind of wanted to ask you, what inspired you to become a writer? Um, when my kids started reading, so elementary school, I started going back and rereading all of these books that I had loved. And I started writing my own stories. I had stories. Um, I actually owned a publishing company for a number of years. And so um, published my own works and uh, others, um, but just, I never, I, I was not, a, I have like, I was a science major. I did, that was not my thing. I was not a girl who was going to be a writer, but um, I have these stories and I really enjoy the process. And I come about it from a very organized kind of way in a way. Um, but just to talk about that, you, we had had a conversation, you and I, about what kind of writer we are. And there's yes. outliner. And then they have this term called pantser, which we both hate, which is writing by the seat of your pants, which neither of us, we're neither of those. You had said, well, I'll let you say what you are, but I'll say what I am. I'm an archaeologist. I <laughs> cover the story. It feels like it's already there. And I'm yeah. just taking the dirt away and uncovering it as I go. Yeah. For me, I'm... Um, we have um, a writer here, Isabel Comedy, and she was the first one to coin the phrase that I know of, and that was instead of being a plotter, so they're the people that plot the story out, you were a panther, and that was somebody who stalked the story. You didn't want to know what the story was beforehand because you can't surprise anybody that way. It's kind of like taking a trip, planning the whole trip before you go, it's sticking entirely to this not listening to what the locals have got to say and not thinking anybody can tell you anything about the country that you've never been to, right? Um, so for me, I like to just let the characters lead me where they're going. I can stop and research if I have to. Um, quite often I have to. Like I'll just get a little thought in my brain. It's like go go look this up or go check that or go see if this is true because I like to put as much reality in there as I can. It's up to the reader to define where the boundary between fantasy and reality stops. And, I mean, that's true of life too, <laughs> really, when you're talking about yeah. all of it. So for me, I am definitely the other way. I don't like to, if I had to sit there and plot out a book before I wrote it, I would be so bored actually writing it. Like, well, I would never get started because I can't, I can't see the whole plot. I know the beginning, I kind of no. know the middle, and I sort of know the end. But, when you, you know, when you start writing things start happening and you're like, oh, yeah. oh that's going to happen. <laughs> exactly. I mean, seriously, I've had my characters absolutely, I, I just kill myself laughing where they'll just do something out of the blue. All my jaw will drop where they just, you yeah. know, do something really unexpected or that I didn't see coming, which, of course, is thrilling because if I didn't see it coming, nobody else saw it coming either, which is, yeah, because um, this is a, the problem I have with watching so many TV series and movies 
is like I can tell you probably from the first five minutes of the film exactly what's going to happen, yeah. how it's going to unfold, what the ending's going to be, and how big the budget's going to be. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my boyfriend and I so, have that, that game. Can we te- can we figure out who's going to tell the end of the, the show we're watching yet? Yeah, or they get too smart where it's just like the whole thing doesn't make sense until the last five minutes, but then nobody cares because they've got frustrated with it way back there. And well, they're, they're cheating. Thing. You have to give some clues up ahead. You have to. You, everybody was raving about Inception, and I remember going to see it and getting to the end and going, so they didn't know what to do with the ending. Is that what you're telling me? <laughs> it's like, what a cop out. Come on. They're going, no, you're supposed to, you're supposed to imagine what happened. It's like. Well, what did I pay them for? <laughs> you know, right. I, I can't imagine it. But I mean, you know, don't lay it out on a silver platter either, but you know, finish the film. <laughs> yeah. um, so with writing, do you have a time? Do you have like a, a, a like for me, for example, when I had young kids, I used to get up and write in the middle of the night, like I'd feed one, put it down, go write till five o'clock in the morning. These days it's kind of like when the kids are at school. Um, although I've just about finished with kids at school as well, which is very exciting. But how do you do it? So I am not at the place where you are, where I'm writing full time. So I have a full time day job. So I write on Saturday and Sunday mornings about yeah. hours or so. So I'm not cranking out the kind of word count that I'd like to. I try and write during the week sometimes, but by the end of the day, it's just hard to mm. focus. Um, but I would say, um, yeah, that's what I've been doing. Saturday morning, I'll get up, have my coffee. If I try not to procrastinate too much and then get to writing for three hours or so. Yeah, it's hard enough doing it full time, but procrastination, yeah. that is. It's like, oh, I'll have a cup of tea. Oh, I'll just put that load of washing. Oh, I'll just put it. Yeah. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. To, to actually, it's Isabel. Well, and that's interesting because people will ask me, I ask you all the time, oh, I have a book I want to write. What should I do? And every author always says, butt in chair. You have to actually mm. sit down and write the book because, you know, otherwise you're just talking about it. <laughs> it's like, no, a worst one is I have a really great book. You should write it. Ah, it's yeah. like, oh, my God. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God. I need therapy after questions, after statements like that. Well. <laughs> yeah. No, please. It's like I have a zillion. They're lined up. You know, I my know. muses are like lined up for weeks. Um, well, well, I'd like to know where you get your ideas for all of your stories because you've written so many and it just seems like, are you thinking ahead? Like you have a book already in mind for the, the next one? or I would say the key thing that drives me with a story is I'm into earth mysteries, any sort of earth mysteries, like where we came from, usually the great big huge questions, you know, like what the Gnostics were talking about when they were talking about the archons, things like that. Like that just drove my last book. Like it was just like I have to completely dive into that and find out what the story was. And even if it went on for 10,000 years, that's fine. (laughs) We can cover that. Um, And I do. And that's what drives me. It's like I'll usually find a mystery I, I love time, I love playing with time travel. That's one of my favorite things to play yeah. with. Um, and if it's not time travel, it'll be like big jumps through time, like different periods. I like to have different eras driving each other. And I like to go, you know, if there's somewhere I want to go explore, it's like uh, I think we got to the end of the light field and all I knew is we were going somewhere with pyramids. And I'm going, oh, no, I don't want to do ancient Egypt. It's been done to death. And it's like, well, there's pyramids other places, you know. And I'm going, yeah, like where? It's like, well, go and investigate. And so I did. And I came out with China. I'm just going. Oh. oh my God. So well, um, I just finished um, Echo in Time, the second in the Ancient Future trilogy. And she travels back to Atlantis and then to the 20th century and then to the 13th century and all, you know. Yeah, that was cool. <laughs> yeah, we like to we go everywhere, man. There's nowhere my characters won't go. They're famous for just diving right in and just going anywhere, which is why that particular trilogy, that that particular story. I mean, I thought it was a short story, and it was a trilogy, and then it grew into universe. Like, I mean, we will start crossing universes. Like, we're dealing with four universes by the end of the thing. It's like Stargate only. It's like Game of Thrones on steroids. <laughs> I find it really cool that you can, you start off with a small idea, but then when you get, you know, two, three books down the road, 
it's like, oh, well, that thing that happened in the first book has set up this thing that's happening in the fourth book that I didn't even know was going to yep. Well, I mean, being in the field was a whole new trilogy, I thought. And I'm walking around this spaceship recognising everyone, going, why am I recognising everyone? <laughs> It's like this. Is, oh no! Oh, God, I thought it was rid of you, Malvin, but no, you're back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, you might be Luchin now, but uh, you're not fooling me. I know who you are. I know who you are. Oh my God, here we go again. So yeah. Um, so really, my characters inspire me too. Like, um, and I think that's why my readers have to just keep going back and rereading and reread because they just want to spend time with those people because they grow so much learning as I learn you know I've learned the esoteric stuff I've learned the quantum stuff and they've been learning with me all the way along so they're growing and this is every time my readers go back and read it again they've kind of grown as a person and they learn they get more out of it um which is why some of the books my books look like they've kind of come out of the Alexandra library or something because <laughs> they've like been around for like a couple of thousand years because they've been yeah. so bad at improving <laughs> But that's interesting because I feel like I've grown in my books. I came out a little softer in the field. I wasn't ready to be all out with some of these yeah. ideas. And now that I'm in, I'm writing the third book in the series, it's it's out there. I mean, it's all out there. I'm I'm bearing my soul. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't care how much you think I am. It's, you know, it's, and yeah. I mean, I was, it's I science. Think, uh, it's based in science. <laughs> exactly. I mean, when I wrote the um, ancient future, people were saying, "Oh, the ideology is insane." You know, it's it's ridiculous. And so, I mean, that's why I was in tears when I saw Being in the Field because it was like, "Oh my God! Thank God! Finally, science caught up." You know, yeah. I mean, they've actually discovered. They think they've discovered that we've got a soul. Breakthrough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think the ancient Egyptians knew that, but okay, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. So where do you get all your names and stuff for your characters? How do you name um, places, people, or yeah. how do you choose them? Yeah, so um, Marcy, who's Eric's, the, she's the, the protagonist and catalyst. Uh, there's actually yeah. a prequel that I wrote that's going to be re-released at some point, and she's the protagonist of the prequel, when she's 12 years old, but Marcy, her name is one of my high school friends, uh, Marcy Rubel, so really good friend of mine, and I just loved the name. So um, I often take names if I'm if I'm fashioning the character somewhat after someone in real life. Then yeah, yeah, I do that too. Yeah, then I take their name and I morph it a little bit, <laughs> and it's not exactly <laughs> that person, of course. I'm never, no one is ever appearing in my books. Yeah themselves no. it's, it's and every character has a little bit of me in it I think it's just different aspects of me um but I I am um, sometimes like Renee's last name is Auberge and that that's you know like Aubergine it's purple in French so I, I'll sometimes I google names and sometimes I just you know store names up that I hear and think oh that'll be a good name for a character yeah, I mean, they were so lucky these days. I mean, I had to go out and buy, like, um, name the baby books and stuff yeah. like that to do, yeah. to do mine back in the beginning, where these days you can just go to a place that's got a oh. random random Viking name yeah. generator or right. something. Or French and names. Like, oh, and then, yeah, this is a small you're off to the races. Yeah, <laughs> pick one. You know, fairies, aliens, whatever you want, you know. They've got, like, yeah. a whole <laughs> Fairy <names>. random <laughs> Which is so good. And, I mean, I, I even, I, I think I even found one for cyborgs. Like, you know, I was recently had some transhumans, you know, I needed some cyborg names. Um, so um, have, you've travelled a bit in your books. They've moved around. So where, is there somewhere you've really liked being, like you didn't want to go, you didn't want to leave? In my books? Um, yeah. You know, I... So I write young adult novels and yeah. um, when I was writing The Field, my kids were in high school. And so I was listening to, you know, they were, they were talking in front of me. All their friends would hang out at my house. So they would talk about stuff, you know, just random things like 
they would do in the cafeteria at school. And I would gather those bits and pieces of information. So not that I want to go back to high school at all, but that was kind of fun, that whole writing about high school and reminiscing about it and all the experiences that I had from high school. Um, right now, I am, um, my characters are in France, some of the characters, and I, I was wanting to go to France last year and obviously couldn't because of COVID. That's my big next trip is my boyfriend and I are talking about going to to France and, and hopefully getting in a little Spain while we're in there. But um, so I went on a trip with my daughter two years ago, might be three years ago. Um, and we, we were in France and just, I've been there several times and really love it there. So. <laughs> yes, I want to go to France. Me, I was yeah. like, well, Atlantis. I was like, going, well, that that pool, I, I, I could, I could live there. I, know. I, just, I would have lived there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you're working on the third book now. What's it going to be called? What's it going to be called? Yeah, um, do you know? Have you got a title yeah, yet? I don't know if I should say. Uh, I have two titles that I'm kind of working with. Um, I'm not going to say, cause I'm not sure yet. Okay. <laughs> it's basically That's I'm right. writing it. Go ahead. Sorry. No, but it's set. So it's set in France. Well, so, so the field is, is Eric's perspective. Catalyst is Marcy's perspective. I tried to write Catalyst from both of their perspective, but I totally couldn't do it. I completely yeah. messed it. My brothers both read the book and they're like, this sucks, you know, so you have to redo the whole thing. So <laughs> just from Marcy's perspective, Thanks, thank, thank, well, I was glad, you know, you need that kind of feedback. You need that yeah, kind of feedback. So, so the next book, book three is from both of their perspectives. So Marcy is in Washington, DC and Eric is in France. So this and now it works. along at the same pace and they're sort of interacting as they go. That's because I had, a, I actually had a friend of mine going, Oh, I, I've been writing a book and then I, I swapped to another first person ex perspective for the next chapter. And she's going, I don't think you can do that. I said, I just did that 12 times in my last book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. If it okay. works, if it works, you can do whatever you want, right? You've just got to be able to do that. You've just got to be able to like, you know, jump from one person's head to the other and remember whose head you're in. <laughs> so yeah. Jumping yeah. around. So, um, do you have a huge um, online presence too? Where do you hang out? Yeah, like so I'm on, yeah, I'm on Instagram, Tracy Richardson, author. Um, I'm on Twitter, but I'm not very active. I haven't got the hang of Twitter yet, so <laughs> I don't like it as well as Instagram. Um, it's kind of, yeah, I find it, it's a bit kind of like, it, it's not a very, um, it's not a very spiritual place. It's a place to, you know, go find out like, oh, what was that flash in the sky earlier? You know, like a million yeah. people will have tweeted about it. And you go, oh, all right, that's what it was. But um, yeah. as far as like um, I found that on Instagram people are um, really sweet and um, yes. on um, like YouTube, I because I do a lot of YouTubing, I'm probably put this interview on YouTube. Yes, if, yes. You my, know, channel people, too. my channel too, my channel too. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I've, I've found that um, they're really good. Facebook, have you found Facebook's been a bit quiet lately? Has anybody else found that? I'm just wondering. Yeah, people are moving away there. from it, especially my audience, younger people. They're not on Facebook as much. No, they're kind of TikTokers or what's that other one? Um, it sounds really horrible, like Disharmony or something. <laughs> no, that's not what it's called, yeah. but... <laughs> But then I have a blog, I do a blog, and I also have a newsletter, which, so there's, you know, lots of ways to, www.tracyrichardsonauthor.com is the website. Yeah, I just do, um, uh, tracyharding.com is my website, and I've got allthingstracy.com.au as a store, because I, I actually have um, started doing my own books, because a lot of them have gone print on demand, yeah. Out here because publishers just aren't kind of, you know, I mean, some of them are sitting in the storehouse, but um, it's just great to have a store because uh, people can just find them readily without having to wait for the print. And then you get them signed through. too. Yeah. So actually speaking about that, tell us about your journey to being published. Like um, you didn't go through, do you have an agent or you didn't go no. through it? Because 
No, that's kind of it's kind of like an old thing right. now. It yes, is, I, yeah, it is. I mean, I, there's just so many ways to be published. So I, exactly. I did a publishing company, yeah, and published my books, two of my books through the publishing company. Um, and then when we decided... And that was interesting, actually, stop there, because the, with the publishing company too, I found it really interesting because it was somewhere between um, like regular publishing and, and self-publishing. It was kind of sitting in the middle there rather than actually being entirely self-published. So well, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. So, so with Luminous Books, it was traditional publishing. So we published other yeah. books in a traditional way. With Brown Books, yeah. who's my publisher now, it's a hybrid publisher. Yeah, love, love Brown yeah. Books. Love, 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 love Tom Reality and... Amy, because you were sing, you were singing their praises to me too. Yeah, going, oh, yeah. America. So it's a hybrid, which means that um, I pay the upfront costs of yeah. getting my book created, but I retain the rights to my books, and I get a much higher royalty percentage. So um, it's it's a kind of I mean, Brown Books is like what brilliant most growing independent publisher in the industry. So it's kind of a new way of looking at it. Um, some people will say, oh, that's self-publishing, that's vanity, but it's not, not at all. No, because, I mean, there's a whole lot of things that go with that, like pr what well, promotion is really the main reason that you go through a publisher and don't self-publish because right. they've got that and the sales team that's going out there and selling it into libraries into stores into that you know that kind of thing as well as you know setting up this kind of affair like publicity and stuff like that and that's all very different I think if you if you self-publish and then uh, but maintaining rights is really great because you've got things happening now like blockchain publishing um, which you know probably a lot of your traditional publishers haven't haven't gone there i think there's only two publishers in the world that actually publish on the blockchain but that's going to become a thing as well like ebooks or what have you you know so there's a lot of really great reasons for maintaining your copyright and being able to publish traditionally, I think that's absolutely, that's probably one of the best deals I've heard. And I've interviewed quite a few <laughs> authors and asked them that particular question. So I think that, um, that's a really, um, that's a good point for anybody looking to self-publish. The thing these days is really not about getting on with the publishing. I know a lot of publishers that have, I mean, a lot of authors that have actually rejected um, like big publishing deals because it really just doesn't suit them anymore um, from right. you know, just making Unless a living. you're Michelle Obama. Yeah, I mean, unless you're Michelle Obama or someone like that, they're not going to put a big camp marketing campaign behind you. It still falls on you to do the legwork, get the word out, all that, do these kinds of events. You know. the genre, what do they classify yeah. you as as a genre over there? What do you classify that? Young adult wondering. science fiction. Yeah, young adult science young fiction. Science fiction. Yeah. Okay. Because I've it's been, difficult. I've like, I've, yeah, it is, isn't it? I was talking to you about this the other day and saying there should actually, esoteric, that's the word I was looking for before, esoteric fiction, because a lot of people think esoteric means a cult, but it doesn't. It actually means just unknown. Like time travel, for example, would be an esoteric concept because it is an unknown concept. Well, at this time, we think, although there's probably a lot the government aren't telling us. <laughs> But you know, yeah, um, so I was like, and I've yeah, I've been put all over the place because I've got autobiographical stuff in my books, and I, you know, and the metaphysical side of things too. They kind of just don't know where to put you, but apparently, yeah. we're fantasies. Okay, <laughs> I like being fantasy genre Beautiful. for many reasons because there's no can limit. I say something? Can I say something um, that just occurred to me about something we talked about earlier? So you were talking about people being brought into the concepts of what we talk about through our books, but I know you probably yeah. had this experience and I've had it too. Every time I meet with um, readers and I'll, they'll talk about intuition or connecting with the collective consciousness, everyone has an experience like that. Oh. Whether it's something small, like you knew that your friend was gonna call you on the phone and they did, or something big, like you knew something big was going to happen around 9-11, but you had no idea what it was. I had a radio interview where the guy said, I have it recorded on the radio that I was having some kind of a premonition about something that was going on. 
I didn't know what it was. And, and he talks about like a plane and whatever. And then, I don't know, a couple of days later, the, the 9-11 crash happened. So everybody has some kind of an experience, but it's like a muscle that you can exercise and make stronger if you just practice kind of tapping in a little bit more. Exactly. But then there's the other side of that too. And it's like, did I create that? Because this, everything is relative to the observer, like actually predicting something. Can it become a self predict, uh, a self, um, you know, propagating prophecy. Yeah. Fulfilling self fulfilling prophecy. That's the word. Um, because, you know, that's also um, another way of looking at it. Like, you know, when somebody's very sure the plane's going to crash, you know, like one of the, it's not ironic, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> it's premonition. It's or premonition. it could be creating your own reality. Exactly. Right. right. So, um, you know. Questions? Sure. What you got? Okay, so Amy has asked, um, environmental issues are a major theme in your work, Tracy. How would you describe the current state of our nation's relationship with these issues? Uh, um, I think... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Both of you. You can't say just Tracy, can you? You have to... <laughs> just wait, oh. hold on. <laughs> go, Tracy. <laughs> All right, well, um, I, in, in the U.S., um, you know, there are really two, school, two schools of thought, whether climate change is real or not. And again, coming from a science standpoint, which is always my baseline, um, it is real. And so it's extremely important that we do something about it because our actions are affecting the planet. Um, my, my brother, we, I grew up in Chicago. My brother now lives in the San Francisco area. And he sent me um, a little note. Uh, a, a text that, uh, to an article that said that winter is leaving the Great Lakes. So that we have these big Great Lakes in the Midwest, huge, like oceans of fresh water, and the, they get cold. And I don't know the details. I didn't have time to read the whole article, but th they have this thing where the cold and the, the warm water switches and it, it brings up nutrients and all. Well, that's not happening to the extent that it used to. That's, that's that's, you know, in the Midwest, we don't see a lot of climate change, except for maybe tornadoes. We don't see the hurricanes, we don't see the rising seawater, but the Great Lakes, yeah. So that's very concerning. And, and I try to raise the alarm in my books. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, personally, um, I think all this talk about climate change and stuff, it doesn't matter whether there's climate change or not. We just have to do better. We just have to do better, not polluting, do everything you can, you know, whether we're causing it or just exacerbating the problem, whether this is a natural thing that the planet goes through or whatever, all we can do is do our best with it and, and care for those little creatures, you know. They're all depending on us. And that's what I really worry about more than humanity. I mean, bugger humanity, we've really stuffed things up. But animals and nature and this planet are more important in my opinion yeah. um you know so we just need to do basically do better it doesn't matter don't you can argue to you blue in the face whether it's happening or not but pollution is certainly happening and please tell me that you think this idea about putting reflective bloody metals up in our atmosphere to block out the sun like cause a nice nuclear winner thank you mr bill gates um <laughs> is a bad idea because seriously I what goes just, up what, yeah why don't we just stop polluting? I mean, this yeah. is a beautiful be place that we live in, a beautiful place. When we go hiking in the woods, there's always trash. It's like, why can't you just pick up your trash, people? Yeah, it's hard to understand. <laughs> I mean, I, here I know um, in Australia we've got a lot better with that. We're a lot more aware of it and I mean I think because we have so many natural bloody disasters too we're very aware about the animals like the, the, the critters that we share the bush with yeah. um we had a real dilemma up where I used to live because somebody had let feral cats go and then it's kind of like okay trying to save the kittens <laughs> not let them go feral you know you've got to put down the cats because you can't release them back out in nature even if they have been neutered they're going to be killing the natural wildlife, you know. So there's all these dilemmas because somebody left their cat behind because it was pregnant. 
you know, and all of a sudden all the little furry animals are suffering. We're losing all our little finches and stuff like that because the cats aren't getting fed, you know. <laughs> so yeah. It's like we just need to do better and just be responsible for our own stuff and that's where creating your own reality is so important and that people understand that they create what happens in their life and so if you are a good person and you think good thoughts that's what you attract and they may think that's airy fairy but actually it works for me I've got to tell you I don't have any people in my life that I consider to be a negative influence and it's not because I've blocked people out of my life it's just because you attract like attracts like that's what you choose you know? yeah yeah, so if you want a better life, really just be a better person and you'll get a better life. <laughs> it's really that easy, you know. <laughs> Take responsibility for what you do and you feel so much better not blaming people, you know. And uh, that kind of got off the subject from the environment, but it's all kind of, uh, you know, tied up together, I feel. Be decent human beings and take care of your home. Yeah. It's so funny that you guys uh, mentioned pollution, especially with the, the new mask everywhere and the mass pollution that's happening. Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah. I'm so glad. And yeah. I mean, I go to the supermarket, I can still smell things through that mask. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm if sorry. I can smell things through that mask, you know, and I'm pretty sure that if you smoked a cigarette and you blew it, it would just you'd see it <laughs> well but people are leaving the masks on the side of the road in the forest park, I know. The, the whole i mean it used to be straws now it's masks like people are yeah people suck sometimes it's like, <laughs> pick up your i know I know, it's so frustrating. It's like, really, we're just jumping from the frying pan into the fire here, but okay. <laughs> like, there's got to be a Do you have some way. other questions for us? I do. So what are some small ways that you believe anyone could start doing today other than stop polluting that can help? <laughs> um, well, I would say the biggest impact on global warming is carbon emissions. And the biggest culprits are corporations. So it's difficult for us as individuals to do something. So in my opinion, it's speaking out and speaking truth to power and contacting your legislatures to try and make change. But on, on an individual basis, um, you know, plastic is like, the, in plastic in the oceans, there's like a, 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 an island of plastic in the Pacific Ocean, the side of, size of Rhode Island. It's hard to really understand how big that is, but it's it's horrible. Yeah, it's huge. And I mean, it's really great to see all these um, these companies bringing out these plates that are biodegradable, that are made out of something you can eat. And if you don't want to eat it, the birds will eat it, or the fish will eat it, or yeah, or, like out of banana leaves or brilliant. avocado avocado uh, pits, that kind of sort of thing. Yeah, I've seen that too. You know, necessity is the you know a genius of invention or something you know it's yeah. like exactly right like you just I think people are already kind of all over that and that big pit in the middle of the ocean you know some young kid created this fantastic vessel to go out there and scoop it all up and sort yeah. it out you know I've seen that and it, that just really you know it excites me it's an exciting time to be alive because I think people are, are figuring out that um that we can do this. We, we, you know, we don't have to be the disposable society. Actually, it's better if we're not. It's better if you reuse things, you know. I have yeah. all sorts of clips and amazing new little gadgets so that I don't need to use all that rubbish anymore. Right. But, again, with your mindset, take responsibility. Yeah. All right, Tracy Richardson, I have a question from Alex. How do you balance writing compelling characters with informing people about spirituality and the environment? Ah, that's a really good question um, because especially when you're talking about science topics, it can get bogged down pretty quickly. So I guess my, my characters are learning about these issues. Um, they don't purport to be experts at all. Um, they're fallible. They make mistakes. They um, explore and they have doubts about themselves um, as they learn. And then there's always a character who has the information to share or has insights to share. Um, so I try and do it in little bits and pieces and, and weave it in as part of an exciting concept of discovery for the characters. Yeah, that's the way I do it too. 
you just explained that beautifully. I don't really yeah. <laughs> Exactly what I do is I'll find a premise and I'll find a way to work it into the conversation or and I, I, I noticed that that's what you were doing, like just beautifully leading people through it, which is exactly the way I do. So you don't actually feel like you're just getting off topic. It's all part or of the dump, flow. And that's like a dump, yeah. Just keep it. Yeah, no, I hate those. And they're so obvious when you do that. So, yeah, best not to go there if you're a writer. But, yeah, you just work it into the conversation or into something that happens, you know, like into a situation. And, um, yeah, that's the way I do it too. Awesome. Um, Emily asked, how can you express the destruction of fracking to help other people understand why it's important? Just go watch the earthquake guy. <laughs> five minutes <laughs> and he'll show you that all those earthquakes they're just happening right along those fracking lines all of them like there's all connects you know he'll show yeah. you yeah <laughs> when they pump all those it. yeah when they pump all that water and chemicals into the ground it causes earthquakes like tracy said in places that don't have earthquakes like in in kansas and it also pollutes the groundwater with all these totally unregulated chemicals they didn't even say what it is. And, and like you were saying about the guy that went on the river and lit the river on fire, people can light their faucets on fire. And yeah. then it's naturally occurring methane. Yeah. So, but, but when you release the methane into the well water, it's poison. So yeah, exactly. My computer's just telling me I'm going to run out of power in a second. So I'll be back in one second. So just answer a question. I'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's so funny. Uh, Jenny did say what we were talking about with pollution and everything. It's definitely, we're talking about hope here, the, the hope of humanity taking on all of our world problems and making it better, right? Yes, that's, uh, that's the idea is that we're capable of doing this. And that's why the title of, of the book is Catalyst. The characters are catalysts for change, and we all can be catalysts for change. And it may seem daunting, but like what, what we were saying about the power of our thoughts, you know, we can make things happen and we can manifest things ourselves. Um, and there is hope, absolutely hope. Right. I, um, I have a story about manifesting crazy things. I, um, when I moved up here to Queensland, I was sitting outside and I decided that it was about time I sort of got onto the making films. And I asked the universe to send me the director of this particular show. I didn't even know what his name was. I just saw the show, thought, okay, that's, I need someone with that kind of vision. Send me that guy. Two days later, I get a call from someone and she wants to buy the rights and book. And while we're negotiating, she keeps talking about this producer she wants to use, this producer, this producer. And I go and looked him up. <laughs> He's the guy that produced the show. Like that's wow. a one in a zillion chance. Right. Okay, and, and it manifests within a week. Yeah. So that's how, and I wasn't even trying. That wasn't even trying hard. Yeah. <laughs> and, sometimes um, you don't. Sometimes it's better when you don't try hard. You don't, because if you you, if you sit there going, "I want this to happen," "I want this to happen," it's like you believe it won't happen. That's why you've got to keep reinforcing it. It's those little off the cuff thoughts, like, "Oh, gee, it'd be great if that happened." Usually, they're the ones that just go, "Yeah." There you go. Yeah. Well, Jenny, just, Jenny just said maybe it was a premonition rather than a manifestation too. Maybe you were tapping. And see, that's the thing. You've got that constant circle of yeah. creation and that's the partnership because even more than creating your reality, you co-create it with the universe. And yeah. our, one of the questions on my sheet is what's the meaning of life? <laughs> and to me, the meaning of life is creation experience like being here to co-create and experience what's here right what do you think the meaning of life is i think it's um personal growth you know and and, and having fun you know, try not to be so serious about everything and try and enjoy it and, and appreciate you know gratitude is a big buzzword but it's hugely important if you can appreciate the little things <gasps> then the big things kind of fall into place you know Exact gratitude is a huge one. And I mean, just I try every morning when I wake up, first thought, today's gonna be a fantastic day. Start the day every day with that thought, 
train your brain because it's amazing. Actually, on my YouTube channel, I've got a few videos, really short and a couple of minutes long, that are just filled with those kind of affirmations that just get your head in the right place. And that's also part of like what you create because you know, frequencies like mine and frequencies, they just attract each other, you know, frequency yeah. resonates, you know, yeah. that science as well. Right, so, electrons you know, and protons and neutrons are all, like attracts like, yep. I know, it's so exciting, isn't it? I was so excited when science <laughs> just came along and just went, yeah, you were right all along. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. Crazy. Oh, Richardson, what topic would you like to explore in your writing that you have yet to take on? Um. Well, this is a little different. Um, uh, I'd like to tackle mental illness. Like some of my characters are really struggling with, with those kinds of things um, because that's been something that's happened to me personally and to people that I know. And um, I think that it's a powerful message to talk about you know, success and, and getting better and finding help and that it's not, you're not alone, that the millions and millions and millions of people struggle with all kinds of anxiety, depression, whatever, so, but in a fiction format. So I'm not sure how that will look exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when you environmentalism. It could be, yeah, we could type for sure, like being depressed about the state of the world. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. not a stretch <laughs> it's not. yeah what about you Tracy anything you want to write about later on um I yeah god so many things um there's for starters um you know my fans have have looked at this present past which was the last book and gone there's more to that one right yeah there's another two books to that one actually um oh, wow. there's a trilogy <laughs> So maybe go back there, but um, there's also, I was really interested in um, the whole story of the uh, Montauk boys in the US, like them being sent into the future and what they saw there. And um, I'd really, really um, like to uh, do a story about that, which I was going to call Stellium because that was how they um, uh, peg time. When you get a stellium of planets in the same house, um, they all resonate at a frequency, like all the planets sing. And um, when you get them in a stellium, um, they would create a certain sonic and that's the way they'd peg certain uh, periods of time in the story anyway. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to sort of, yeah, more time travel. I like time travel. Cool, yeah. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else? Or I think actually, yep, it's about time to wrap it up. <laughs> we just wanted to say thank you guys so much for talking all the things because this was really enlightening for future writers and definitely for readers like me so do you guys have any last words to say to everyone ah thank you so much for coming big um hi here from uh australia we're having a beautiful day here today um do check out my books. If um, if you're interested to know more, there's a lot of them, but just go to my site. You can, I'll sort you out. Yeah. yeah. And all and thank of you. I'm, thank so thank you, Tracy. I appreciate your interviewing me very much. Thank you. You're very welcome. It was fun. And it, like I said, um, also, if um, I've got, um, my readers are going to probably watching this after the fact, but um you know, if you want another writer, Tracy, it's like seriously, there's paragraphs in there that you, you would think I had written. So <laughs> it's like oh, wow. it's very cool. Thank you. And, and it's great that. to actually read something that um, that spikes my interest, you know, that's just outside yeah. of the realm of normal romance yeah. or, you know, who did it. And they're fun. Whatever. They're fun books, but they make you think. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's what I love, I think. Uh, more, we need more of that on TV as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Well, thank you guys again. And remember, thank you so much for having us. Go to their website if you want to purchase their books or the bookstore where you guys are this event. And their website's in the chat um, tracyrichardsonauthor.com and tracyharding.com. Thank right. you. Bye, guys. Thank Bye. you for having Bye. us. Have a great time. Bye.